great to meet you guys, and I always find it that um, introductions are really important um, because of you know who we are and um, you know just a little bit about myself. Uh, first of all, you know uh, in a crow, uh, I'm a really strong believer in my cultural traditions, practice ways, and customs, and it's not of our nature to talk about ourselves or brag about ourselves and so I'm not here to you know, brag or you know um, boast about myself um, what I'm going to be sharing with you guys is it's, um, it's really rare uh, it's been handed down from fam generation to generation and what it was taught to me by my parents, their parents, and so on and so forth, my grandparents, my great-grandparents. Um, my great-grandparents were in Florida and had big medicine, that's where a lot of this uh, came from. Uh, and my other great-grandparents was uh, Hispanic Stuart White Clay, and you know, it was them, those were the people that were the last of the nomadic Buffalo days, and they were the ones that uh, we had to prepare for the harsh winter to harvest these plants. And so what I'm gonna be talking about with you guys is it's learned behavior. And um, that being said, um, which falls into, um, we're losing a lot of our crow culture, belief ways, custom ways, and what I'm going to be talking about in some of the plants that we have, I have here, um, you, pick, you go and pick anyone in a tribe and you ask them about this, the harvest, the process, and they're going to probably not know. Back in the 1980s, maybe 90s, we still had a lot of old people. They were sure they would tell you where to find these plants, what they were about, the use the purpose, the stories behind it. But nowadays, it's really rare to find an individual with such education. And um, like I said, I'm not here to boast or talk about myself, but I, I guess I could say I'm really blessed. And um, I was, for some reason, I don't know why, but they, my grandparents and parents and great-grandparents showed me a lot of this and you know, the harvesting behind it. And um, you know, when, I, when we go and pick these uh, plants, when we go and pick these um, element, part of the element of the ground, um, you know, I find it really uh, therapeutic. And I could see where they were humble back then. I could see where they showed a lot more appreciation in these medicinal plants. And the reason being is because it takes, go ahead, see. The reason being is because it takes a lot of work. And a lot of these plants aren't found, in, they're not all in one location. They're found in various locations all over. They're not just in the core reservation, they're all over the place. You know, I've traveled a lot of places along in the United States. And I've actually seen some of these plants and I was like, wow, these were here. But I, I, I can believe that the crow, the reason why we chose this place is because all these, uh, the plants that we ha I have here, I mean, in majority, um, are in this place. And uh, what Sorbelli said is, um, you know, crow country is in the right place. And I believe it is. We see all four seasons here. You guys know that. We can go from 100 degrees to negative 20 within a matter of days. And so, um, you know, just to share with you a little more about, you know, the, the loss of, you know, our cultural practice ways um, to grow. You know, I was last, last, summer I was asked, <clears throat> I can't remember that group, but they have asked me, they said, would you be willing to take a group of young kids to go and find 
and show them how to harvest. And I said, yes, I would. If I had the t if I, I found the time, you know, it takes funding. But the pandemic hit. The pan the pandemic hit and it we didn't follow through with it. But I was talking with Sunny Day um, prior to um, this presentation and sometime in the spring I would like to um, I don't know, it's gonna be a I would say it would be quite a journey, quite an adventure, to try and maybe turn it into a class. I don't know how I would go about it. It's never been done before. Um, it's you know to go to these locations. You know, it's it's uh, it, it's going to take a lot, but I'm willing. I'm at an age in my life where I'm willing to take a group of people, starting next spring through the summer and all throughout the harvest season and to actually show them and teach them how to collect these items. And so with that, I'm going to be talking, going back and forth, going through some of the stories. And um, one that I'm going to probably start with is, let's see, we'll start with, uh, this is the uh, juniper. Uh, when we're done here, you guys are more than welcome to come up and look at these. Uh, the juniper, uh, how I was taught to me, through my grandparents and parents, is that um, the story behind it is, uh, do you guys know the story of Big Metal? Not some of the Coach Harbor members, no? Well, I'll just do a really quick, um, quick version of the Big Metal story. Big Metal was, uh, they called him Uibizashi. The crew were camped along the Bicorn Canyon between the Dryhead area and the area and in that area here um, before it was it was the peak season of the summer season and during that time you know the crow people only had a certain time frame to harvest to go and get meat to dry it to tan hide and so the chief at that time in that encampment said all you young men go out go and try and go and find what you need before the, the winter winter months come so, uh, young group of men said, oh, we're going to go find some buffalo. Young group of men said, oh, we're going to go hunt elk. Another group said, we're going to go find some deer. But then there was this young man, and he had a stepson. And he said, we're going to go, and we're going to go look for a bighorn sheep. And believe it or not, the bighorn sheep was part of our appetite at that one point. And I actually tried it at one point, and it's not too bad. It's pretty good, actually. And um, the, do you guys know the war shirt, the crow war shirt? Uh, the front part is big horn sheep. And um, so the big horn sheep was part of our appetite and part of the cultural significance among the crow. And with that, the father and the young man went along the big horn canyon and going along the canyon the stepfather told his stepson, um, the reason how his stepson is because his original dad was killed in battle, so the mother allowed him to go with him. So he, they went to the edge of the canyon and he said, go look down there, see if there's any bighorn sheep. And he said, all right. So he went over and looked over, didn't see him. He said, I don't see him. He said, yeah, there should be some down there, look down there. And so when that little boy went to go look further, his stepfather went in pushed him, pushed him over the canyon, and here he went, and here the father left, and from that analogy, my grandparents always said the big middle story is like our Bible, the crow, they say it's not good to have a step-parent because of that purpose, and when my grandma, my grandma lost her husband, she never remarried. She's widowed for the rest of her life because of her strong belief of that story. That's why they were really cultural back then and she always remembered the big metal story and she said this is the reason why she didn't remarry. And so the father left that time. And the little boy, thinking that he died, he went back into camp and he said, I sent the young boy back. I said, we killed some bighorn sheep. I sent him back, and uh, did he come back? And they said, 
No, he never came back. All the hunters came back that day. But that little boy was missing. So the next day, then they sent out all the young men to go look for this young boy. And they said, where were you at? And here that stepfather lied to them and said, we were over here. He took the phone in the opposite direction. So they, all the young men went out there looking for that little boy. So for days, you know, three, four days, that, you know, they were looking for that little young boy and, you know, didn't find him. But, you know, that lo and behold, that young boy, when he was pushed over by his uh, stepfather, he, when he was rolling down the canyon, when they pushed him down, here he grabbed onto a bush that saved his life. And he held on for three, four days, and that was the juniper tree. And that's what this is. And he held on to that juniper tree, and he prayed and prayed and kept holding on for dear life. And so <clears throat> he heard some talking above him. And he said, Whoever's up there, he said, Help me. He said, I need, he said, I need help getting out of here. And he heard some talking. And these, all he heard was some hoofs, some steps. And next thing you know, he looked up and he looked at the individuals that were talking to him. It was, I think it was the corn sheep. And, you know, and a lot of these stories that I'm talking about, you know, the Crow people were really, well, they lived out there in the elements with the, they call them the beings without fire. And those were the animals. And they learned to live with them out there. The elements they learned to talk with them to communicate and that one time I gave this presentation and that guy was like oh hogwash he was like your story don't make sense you have sheep talking in your story and I said hey hold on I said I'm watching T I watch TV and I said I see Donald Duck I see, Bugs Bunny. <laughs> I see all these animals talking Mickey Mouse, Mighty Mouse, and I said, how come my animals can't talk, you know? Your animal, your animals talk, you know, and he was like, so don't, I said, so don't tell me my story's hogwash. I said, your, your cartoons talk, mine's real life. My people connected with the animals. So <clears throat> this, uh, you know, that belief of communicating with the ones without fire, he, they, those sheep talked amongst themselves and said, we need to help this boy, we need to help him. And so they said, all right, we'll take our turns and we'll get him to the top of the canyon. And so there was seven rams. And um, I, used, I knew some of the crow names for some of them, but the seven rams were bighorn sheep boy, bighorn sheep girl, bighorn ram, and then there was uh, cupped hooves, and then one that runs along the canyon, and then never slips, white horn, wait, never slips, and then the last one was Uwidisash. They called him Thick Metal, and he was the lead ram with the seven rams, and they said his ram's horns were gold. And his hoofs were gold, and that's why they called him Big Metal, Uwe Dizash. And so the first one went down, and they all took turns. That little boy jumped on the back of the ram's back and took him as far as he could. The other ram got tired, and so the other ram came. He jumped on his back, and then they all took turns like that, all the way to the top. And here, when they got to the top, here they got that boy safely out of the canyon. And here when they got him out of the canyon, that boy looked around and he seen all these rams around him and they were tired, they were exhausted, they were panting, exhausted. And here in uh, Big Meadow said, what were you doing down there? What happened? He said, my, the one that was supposed to be my dad, he said, he pushed me over the cliff. And I said, why? He said, I don't know. And then they pitied that young boy. And he said, well, he went through a lot. He almost died, almost faced death. And so he said, well, we're going to bless you. We're going to give you these powers, these medicines. We're going to give you these instructions. 
we're going to teach you. And so, Big Meadow had all the animals throughout the canyon that Power is painted out. He made an announcement in the canyon all you animal life come, we're going to bless this young boy. And then from that point, here all these animals were blessing him. The badger came and said, Here, when you get to your camp, use this to hold down your teepee, and it was a stake. It was a willow found in the ground, and that's what the, uh, that's why the crow put two stripes around the stakes around the teepee because that signifies the signifies the badger, the two stripes on the badger's back. And all these uh, rams gave him blessing, gave him powers, you know, and one of them gave him the sight to see a long ways, to have ample hearing. And <clears throat> here, um, when all, all these rams and all these animals gave him all these gifts, you know, this ties into, if you guys know the parade dance of uh, the Crow tribe, you know, this ties into it, but we won't go into that because it, you know, it gets really lengthy. But, you know, the last part was uh, Big Metal, the chief of the rams, said, I am going to give you my name. And he said, and I'm going to give you this, as it was a piece of sinew. And he said, when you get back to your camp, he said, throw this in the fire right away. And he said, when you see your stepfather, he said, don't do anything. Leave it be. And so, Big Metal gave him his name, and he said, you're going to live to be old, you're going to live to be uh, at old age, and he said, you're going to have a lot of power. And so, after giving him his name, giving him that sinew, that boy took off in the camp. When he went in the camp, he seen his stepfather, the one that pushed him over the canyon here, that stepfather took off out of camp. He ran into his mom's teepee and just threw that sinew in the fire. Threw that sinew in the fire and then he seen his mom and then she was so happy to see him. And then they rejoiced that night, celebrated. And all the young men wanted to go and find that stepfather and kill him. Do what they wanted to him, but then the young boy said, no, leave him alone. He said, it's going to be taken care of. And so with that, with the um, days later, this village was moving away from the Decorn Canyon dry head food area, moving to the next encampment, coming down from the mountain into the, uh, down into the valley for the fall time. And here when they're on, uh, coming along the river here they found they saw this figure it was black it was all mangled up and it was disfigured it was all burnt and here when they looked at it they didn't know what it was but that young boy knew what it was what it was it was that his stepfather and when he threw that sinew in the fire remember how it all shriveled up mangled up it happened to that old man part that stepfather and you know, after that, you know, that's why I said to Crow, the big middle story is kind of like our Bible, because, you know, my grandma always reflects upon it. And she always said, if someone ever does anything bad to you, don't say anything. Give it to Creator. His vengeance is His. When someone does bad to you, just leave it alone. Just move on. And, you know, things like that, how to treat each other, how to be nice to each other. And the story of, you know, the juniper, what saved that little boy's life when he fell off the edge. He grabbed onto a juniper tree. And so in our family, in our Crow culture and custom, the uh, juniper, this is what it signifies, what, it's what saved that little boy's life in the big middle story. So, you know, just next time you guys see juniper, now you know the significance of why us crow use it. And I don't have it with me. Uh, I was trying to find some, but <laughs> my dad ate it up. But um, <laughs> it's um, mahogany. Um, I was trying to, I usually harvest all of these throughout the year. Um, I would get mahogany. And uh, because mahogany, <clears throat> we would get it and mix it with the juniper and we would um, smudge ourselves. 
and it's actually edible. Uh, that's what the bighorn sheep eat. And every time we go out in the hills, my dad would get a bunch of mahogany, and he, my dad actually eats it. It's like salad. And then he'll bring it home and he'll put it in his food, or he'll mix it with a salad, and my dad actually eats mahogany. And I was asking my dad, I was kidding, I was kidding myself to get asking him, like, Dad, where's all the mahogany? And he was like, I ate it up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. So, you know, so um, I, did, I don't have it, but the mahogany is uh, part of the juniper, and it's what the bighorn sheep eat, and I wish I could bring some, but next time if we do this presentation, I'll bring, make sure I'll stash some mahogany for my dad. <laughs> Yeah, and what I'm gonna, let's see, I'll get into the, um, this is uh, sweet sage. Uh, the sweet sage is, from what I was told um, from my parents, my grandparents, so on and so forth, it's handed down from generation to generation. It represents the future. And we're always picking it. We harvest it all year. We try to collect as much as we can because it ties in with the sweat lodge, ties in with the sun dance. And in my family and belief, uh, when we build a sweat, we build a new sweat after we dig the hole to put the rocks in, we get the sweet sage and we'll put it in line around the pit because it represents the future because us crow and we believe in we believe in the future. And it's really strange. That's one thing science cannot explain is have you guys ever had deja vu? Yeah, isn't it really strange? Like you've seen it, you lived it, but it's had you know it doesn't happen until reality hits. And this is part of it. And how they always told me is, you know, if you want, if you're gonna smudge yourself, if you wanna Pray towards the future. You want to ask for blessings for the future. It's to get some sagebrush, roll it up, breathe it in, smudge yourself with it. And in all in reality, you know, have you guys ever done if you, when you're done, go home and do some research on smudging with sage. It's, it's really the science, the science, the science behind it, it's you know pretty spot on for the Plains Indians tribes for them to know this. And um, me, I'm a sun dancer. I've been sun dancing since I was 16 years old. Um, went in every summer, except for one summer. I interned in BC. I didn't be able, I wasn't able to turn uh, sun dance that summer. And in my family, uh, they tell us when we dance, we go without food or water from Thursday evening to Sunday. And we dance in that hot sun. And with our family, history and culture is, is we dance with this because we want blessings for the future. We want to see good things. And so that's what the significance of sweet sage is a chukuba. It's the crow name for it. That's what it represents is the future. And mint. On my right side here. Any of you guys have any mint tea from the store? Anyways, this is picked up. Uh, I picked this right outside of the creek, outside of Pryor, Montana. And, you know, the mint tea is really, um, I find it many uses. Uh, when we get out of the Sundance, being without food or water, our stomachs are empty, and we need something to get our system going and back to its, back to its reality. So we would drink some of this and it are the functions of our immune system, functions of our digestive system, it all comes back into place. And when we have a cold, when we have a stuffy nose, when we can't taste, and this is where this really came in handy during the pandemic, is um, we boiled some of this. And we, when we drank it, it cleared up our respiratory system. And uh, it's actually really tasty. And the fresh mint that we picked. And uh, from when you harvest this, uh, you don't just pick it out of the ground. You don't pull the root out because it belongs to mother. I see a lot of people going and yanking all the roots out and everything, but 
That's not how you harvest it. You leave the root in there. You leave part of it in the ground. What you do is you go and you snip the end of it. Same goes for mint. And the thing about mint is, if you go and just pull the root out, it's never going to grow back into that area. So I always carry a pair of scissors wherever I go because when I see it, I'll harvest it. And then the best time to harvest mint is before the purple flowers bloom on them. Um, because after that, then the tea starts tasting a little bitter. But so the best time to harvest mint tea is from, let's see, after the first bloom, the spring rains, then any time in June, uh, the uh, summer solstice, around the summer solstice is the best time to harvest mint tea before the purple, purple flower blooms on them. And let's see, uh, I've got a few, it's about 10 more minutes here. But I'll, I'll go over um, sweet grass and sweet grass from what I was told, you know, my great great grandfather was uh, ethnic medicine. He was the chief of police for the Crow people, Crow tribe at one point. And from the stories that you know, they they told us is if you're having a hard time, if you're battling something, you know, if you're fighting something, regardless of whatever it is, you know, um, they say you use this before you would use sweet grass when you go into battle. You're gonna be battling something, you're gonna be facing something. You know, sometimes we build that fear, you know, we get worried and it's unhealthy to get worried and what they would do is they would smudge themselves with uh, sweet grass and it's for the significance of when you're going into battle, you're going to be battling something regardless of whatever it is. And uh, fleets, uh, flat cedar, um, how it's used, uh, we use it in the sweat lodge. Also in the Sundance ceremony, um, the, the flat cedar, it's always interesting uh, how the crow obtained flat cedar because you can't find it around here. The only area, the closest area you can find flat cedar here is up in the Salish Kootenai Papua area. So it just went to show that the crow had to go to a far extent to try and obtain the flat cedar. Um, smudging source. So you really think about it, these crows really had to do some traveling to obtain all of this, you know? And you know, to get to one point to their origin, you know, it probably took days, days, maybe even weeks, months at a time. So flat cedar wasn't found around here, so they had to go and travel to get it. You know, which um, leads me to the root. Um, we'll get into Barret here, and the story behind Barret, as told from my father, my great grandparents, so on and so forth, is you know we don't know the precise time, we don't know the exact location, but as oral history has been handed down and handed down, we just carry on the basics and significance of each story, and the story behind Barret is. There was, during a time, there was these young men when they were out hunting back in the nomadic buffalo days. They were hunting down a bear that attacked their village and kind of went through their <coughs> teepees and got into their stash, got into their goods. So they chased this bear down. And here they chased him down all day, all into the night and all into the next day get him away from camp as far as they could in here. They shot at him, chased him down, wounded him, and that bear never gave up. And those young men didn't either. Banged him up pretty good, that bear. And finally, he went down the canyon, and here by the time he got up here, these young men were on the other side, and it was kind of like no use, you know, it's too far. So they, those young men just sat there and made sure that he and go over the next mountain so he wouldn't come back. But as that bear was going alongside of the mountain here, they were watching him, watching his behavior. The bear was tired, he was beat up, he was wounded. And what they did, what that bear did was they, they were watching him here, he was digging in the ground. 
And when he was digging in the ground, he was he dug this up. That's why they call it Bear Root. And they watched him and hear that bear got that root, and he split it apart, broke it off, and here that bear started eating the bear root. And he got some of that bear root, and he put it where his wounds were. And here for that bear was there for several days and doing that. And here the crow were watching him. And here so the, the crow figured there's something good about this. The bear got healed from this, then it's probably good for us too. So after that bear went, and those young men went to go see what he was digging up, and it was this, the bear root. And so that's how the crow came up to having the bear root. And so the crow used this for a lot of things. Um, you know, in high school, you know, I had a real bad toothache that one time. I had a real bad toothache. I got home from school, my head was hurting, and I went to my bed and I laid down, and my grandma came in, and she said, are you okay? I said, no, I said, I have a real bad toothache. Here, she got a piece of this, and here she said, suck on this. And here, I put it where I had a toothache. Started sucking on a bear lit, and here, the pain went away. And I had a friend that had um, uh, ur urinary problems, and uh, he had overactive bladder. And here, he would drink bear root, and it helped him. You know, it didn't cure it, but it eased it. And he didn't uh, go to the bathroom as much. And uh, a lot of the, what my grandma would do, I remember her, she would get this, and she would um, boil it. And after she would boil it, then she would let it sit for a bit. And then the resin from what was boiled, she would get that, and she would put it where her body ate. You know, where she had arthritis, where she had some pain, and it would go away. And I remember her always boiling bear red. And then after she would do that, then she would drink the tea, drink it. It would be like a tea. So, you know, that was the bear red's a uh, really strong red, you know, within the crow people. And um, my brother is pretty old, had this for a while. Um, anyone want to guess what this is? The way um, your ex? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I said that in one of my presentations. It just keeps away your ex, and you're like, come on, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is um, turnips. <laughs> yeah, they call it e hack. Um, it was like the um, Plains Indians um, potato. Um, they would make pudding out of it. Um, they would boil, uh, boil it. They would boil it and they would uh, get the root, dry it, they would braid it like this and they would dry it much of it because that's what got them through the winter months. And they would mash it up and that's what a lot of the babies ate back then. And so, you know, its medicinal purpose is, you know, they could, um, it was more of a preservation for the people back then for food storage. And uh, a lot of the, they used it for a lot of the uh, newborns, for the babies that were just now wanting to eat. And the plant for this, how we harvest it is after we dig it out of the ground, we take the root, we take the flower out, we put it in the ground, and we cover it again, and then it grows back. So that's the proper way of doing it. That one time I've seen a Facebook post of guy went and he picked like 200 turnips, and here he had all the flowers with him, and then I was like, freaking out about that and I was trying to message that guy and show him the proper way of how to harvest her nuts but let's see what else do I have here um it's not um a plant but this is can I guess what this is oh yeah <laughs> some of these crows this is uh gold <laughs> this is gold this will mix this will um Makes you, make you find your next love next time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but Uga, um, I've only found it in certain places within the Crow Indian Reservation. Um, it's a mineral. And um, you guys ever take Tums? Tums, it's like Tums, you know, when they have stomach problems. And when they have stomach problems, uh, it helps out. And when you're low in iron, uh, they would eat it dry it out 
and there's different colors. And uh, there's red, there's, I've seen blue, yellow, uh, not green yet, but, and purple, believe it or not. I've seen a purple clay. And uh, we use this for when we get out on the sun dance. Um, we would get water, chip some of this, make muddy water, and we would drink it. And uh, you know, some of you sun dancers know, but after both, <laughs> without food or water, and we indulge, and it just goes right through. <laughs> so, this helps, you know. It's, uh, it, you know, I, would, I always like to say it puts me up, but it helps uh, get the uh, system back in order. You know, people that are have diarrhea problems, and. Um, <clears throat> With that said, I'm trying to remember, there's a lot, there's a lot I gotta, you know, I gotta go over here. But just in closing here, before we get into, um, before we get into some Q&A, um, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I feel really thankful to try and share as much as I can. You know, I wish we had like an entire day. I would bring a lot more, and there's a lot more to cover. And, you know, as a member of the Crow Tribe, I feel really honored to um, share this information with you. Um, you can't get this in the classroom. You can't get this anywhere else. And we're losing our culture and our customs. We're losing who we are. Nowadays, everyone's, all the children that we have, your children, your cousins, your relatives, who is stuck on the phone, you know, and that's why I wanted to get out and show people how to harvest, how to collect these plants, because to get you out what our ancestors did, what they had to do to prepare for the winter, what they had to do, the hard work, all of this here is not found all in one location. For the mint, I had to, I, I went to Pryor and I had to pick it. That's where I, I always say the best mint is in, in Pryor, Montana. The sweet sage, you find it, you can find it in, in a lot of places, but you find it more in the valleys. But as the bear root, it grows in a high, that bear root grows in a higher elevation. And this is what I've noticed. Uh, it grows in a higher elevation on the side of a mountain that's facing south. I've always found that's where bear root grows. I don't know why, maybe for a reason. I've never found bear root found on the north side of a mountain, maybe because of magnetic pool or something, I don't know. But I've all, we've always found bear root to grow on the south end of hills facing south. And as the um, flat cedar, we only can find that up north, up towards the Pavel, the closest areas, the Pavel area. The turnips I got in Sarpy, out towards the uh, Sarpy coal mine area. We have land out there, we go out there and we harvest turnips. And the juniper, we have to go into the mountains to get. And the sweet grass, you gotta go to Canada. You gotta go to that area to get sweet grass. The guga, the white dirt, I had to get it in the Wolf Mountains. As you can see, these aren't located just in one location. They're located certain areas. And then so to order to obtain all of this, it took a lot of work, it took a lot of labor, it took tools, it took, um, you need a truck to get to some of these places. You gotta actually hike up to get to some of these places. You gotta have that physical ability to get to some, some of these plants. And like I said, I wanted to, you know, teach a class on this and you know, to, I could sit here and I could actually talk and talk and talk, but when you get your hands, the hands-on experience, that's what I want to do, you know, but it's going to take some time. And during this pandemic, you know, my family was like, hey, we should make some kits, you know, and see what we can do to help the people. And so what we did was we got, we got a Ziploc bag, we put some juniper, we put some sweet sage, we put some mint tea, and we put some flat cedar, we got some bear root, and we crushed it all together, and we made a tea, our family tea, and we put it in tea bags, and we put it in the Ziploc bag, kind of like a kit, 
we called we called it we called it two leggings tea a cultural kit to figure out about how the word got it but people were like yeah we want those covid kits i was like it's not a covid kit <laughs> <laughs> people are here to rise why are you guys calling it a covid kit he said because we're, we're boiling this and we're drinking it he said it's helping us and here there was this young this older lady she she, had, she caught covid and she kept calling us and she said can you bring some and i said bring it here she was drinking our mint tea and drinking the bear root tea to make sure that we made she was drinking it. She said, man, this is helping me breathe. She said, it's helping me sleep. And she it constant, she was constantly drinking it, helping herself. And here she uh, saw there was there's so many stories. People come and they thank us. And they say, we want to thank you for bringing those because he said it really helped us a lot. And here at that time, we did it at no, at no cost. And here, man, we were running out of supply. We were running out of supply, and I was like, hey, mom and dad, I said, man, we got to go after some more supply. I said, I said we're running out. I said, what are, we, what are we used to get through the winter? And here, so it was towards the end of um, harvest season. Some of these plants weren't dried up yet. And so filled up the truck, got food and everything. We went out, and man, we harvested again for winter. Man, during the pandemic, and then here, so man, we accrued a lot of cost trying to do this trying to make these kits the manpower, going after it. And then here, I was like, hey, you know what? I said, what if we charge like $10 a day? Then we use that money for fuel and go after some more. And here, so we started doing that. We started charging $10 a day to people that wanted it because man, when we gave it out for free, man, people were coming. But man, this was a lot of hard work to get all of this. A lot of hard work. And I said, I, I said okay, so we would sell it for 10 bucks and whatever we made, we put it in gas and go after some more. Man, it was never ending there. But man, we supplied as much as we could to our co people during the pandemic. And these teas and these plants are the ones that helped pull our people through. And we lost a lot of loved ones. All of us know some of that we lost. You know, the one that I'm talking, you know, a lot shared a lot with me, a lot of these stories. Uh, I lost him to COVID in the Sarge War. And, you know, it's tough, it's hard, and um, gosh, it just took him so quick. And I'm glad he showed me whatever he could. And so with that, um, you guys have any questions?